Got a pretty crazy story today. Stories from the field. Artemis, August, September already. September 2024. Uh, this is a story about bomb shelters. Bomb shelters in the kibbutzes that were attacked on October 7th. Let me paint a picture. You and your family, kids running around, playing in the street. You guys live a mile away from the Gaza border. On the other side, there's a bunch of people that want you dead. And they shoot rockets at you. You have seconds, four to five seconds to find shelter whenever uh, a rocket goes off. Uh, you have a safe room in your house. So you run into your house. You're protected for the most part, unless there's a direct hit. That, that can go either way. But in the street, there's really no protection. There's a couple of... I mean, it's a small... Uh, it's not even a town. It's, it's a small community of like 600 people. They have a couple of public places where they get together, where they do... They actually eat together in these kibbutzes. They have a big uh, community... Um, dining hall or whatever there's uh, obviously a school or sometimes not obvious sometimes they, they drive their kids to like a regional school in the public areas there's really not that many shelters to hide in whenever there's an attack basically you just lie down on the ground cover your head make sure that your kids do the same and you just pray for the best our organization that i work with we've been doing this project where people donate money to to, uh, for us to put in shelters in these locations. So we put up, it's not that many, it's like 25 shelters on the Gaza border. Every kibbutz has a team of first responders. It's like a security team. Um, they train, they're armed. They're the ones that, that were fighting off uh, all the terrorists and um, did a really good job, actually. They were outnumbered. They didn't have the, the, the weapons that the attackers came with. That's actually a whole other story in itself I, I may get into. Um, so there's uh, a commander that, that coordinates all the work of the, of the security teams in the different kibbutz uh, communities. And we work with the, uh, the help of, of this commander who is in contact also with the army. He does all the evacuations. I call him the ninja. He is, he is amazing. He is really well trained. He's got a, plenty of experience militarily. He's done evacuations. He's pulled people out. He was out there fighting off the terrorists. Really cool guy. There's a lot of really cool guys down there. Anyway, uh, with the coordination of, of the commander, he'll tell us where in, his commu in each community to put the, uh, the bomb shelter. Whenever you're out on the street, you have a new bomb shelter, there's, a, uh, there's rockets incoming, you run in there and, and be safe. Theoretically, we didn't know that there would be such a, a big invasion, uh, ground invasion by the terrorists, and, and those shelters didn't really work for that because they're not meant to. They're meant to protect you from the shrapnel, basically. But it didn't really work like that because you can't lock the door and you can't really protect yourself from, from the attackers that are outside. Barry is one of the kibbutzes that got hit the most. There's like 300 dead in that one community, a bunch taken also. So I go to Barry and we go to install this, this bomb shelter. And we usually put a, a small plaque should have one. One second. So we usually put a plaque like this on the shelter to thank the donor. And I go up there to, uh, to Barry and put up the plaque. And the donor says, hey, I don't want my name on the shelter. Why don't you put a Bible verse on this plaque and, and put it up? So I get that printed. I, I go and pull the, the plaque off of the bomb shelter, replace it with a new one with... Um, um, with a Bible verse. I just kept the, the old one in an envelope. And I didn't realize it until months into the situation, months after, around December or something, I'm sitting, cleaning up my desk, and I pull this thing up, and it's the Barry Platt. It's a funny feeling, you know? I don't live there in the kibbutz. I don't know what it's like to be attacked by terrorists. I don't know what it's like to be hiding in a shelter and them. Um, throwing grenades inside. I didn't live through that personally, but I've talked to many people that did. 
I heard many stories about how that went down. And we were involved with this, with these communities years before and even through the war. We're, we're going up up north to, uh, to put up shelters. Um, now with uh, all the rockets and coming from Hezbollah from, uh, from Lebanon, we're putting up shelters over there, same thing. You know, kids are laying down in the streets to, to protect themselves. Maybe I should explain why you have to lie down. The problem isn't the rocket itself. It is, if it's a direct impact. But the chances of a direct impact getting you are pretty low. There's a lot more chances that you'll get hit by shrapnel. A rocket's been intercepted. Of course, if you're lying down, covering your head, the shrapnel flying from the sky can still get you. But if there's an impact nearby, it sends a big wave of shrapnel around the same height, which is about like three feet off the ground. You can see it. There's an, uh, there's an explosion. The crater isn't very big. These are not huge rockets. So there's, there's like a, a hole, a small hole in the ground. And then all around in a diameter of 10 yards or, or more, it depends on how far things are from the, from the side of the impact. So basically if you're standing when there's an impact nearby, you get hit right in the stomach. Or if you're a child, in the face. That's why laying down could really save you from that kind of impact. So Barry Plaque sitting on my desk is it's been a pretty big reminder for me of everything that's going on. People living in the kibbutz are really hardworking, really special kind of people. Actually, most of these people have been very vocal about uh, Palestinians' rights. They're the ones that have pushed for Palestinians coming over and working in Israel. Their homes have been visited by Palestinian workers, a lot of them. Actually, those Palestinian workers were going back to, to Hamas and, uh, and, and giving, their, giving over information about the layout, maps, uh, people's families. They knew what they were doing. At the same time as the Israelis, the kibbutz members, are inviting them in to give them a chance to, to work, to try to build relationships. And these are the people that got killed, and these are the people that got taken away. These are the people that are still sitting there, hostages. It's a crazy world. The Barry plaque on my desk is a big reminder of how crazy this world is. Death and attacks and all the craziness are as, as horrible as that is. It's only a symptom of the situation. There's so much hatred in this world and so much going on behind the scenes. And, and this, is, this is the result. And the more that that hatred is perpetuated by the media, by, by groups like Hamas and their friends up north and the Ayatollahs. The more that hatred is perpetuated, the more effects you'll see. And not only in Israel, in the, in anywhere in the free world. Just Can you give me an example of any hateful country that's doing good? Anybody? There's no single, civilization has never built on hatred. It's always been peace and, and diplomacy and, and love of some kind. There's so many countries in this world that have made lives impossible for their citizens. And most of those are some kind of hateful philosophies and hateful countries. So, takeaway, don't hate. Uh, it's easy to fall into the, the hatred thing, especially listening to the news. Listen to these stories. Listen to the stories of the people. Um, i got plenty of stories to share. So come back tomorrow. I'll tell you another one.